Hi everyone and welcome to Cards on the Table, a podcast by the Referees Association. My name is Joe Larkin and today I'm delighted to be joined by my co-host Callum Jones and Super League referee Liam Moore. Liam, thanks for joining us mate, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. No, thanks for having me. I know it's a, uh, it's a privilege to come and speak with you guys. Yeah, Liam, thanks very much for joining us. Um, obviously, the Super League just started, so we just spoke off camera that you had the Le- Leeds Casper game at the weekend, so how did they go for you? It was good. It was um, it, it was different this year, to be honest. Obviously, good Friday games and normally high-profile within Rugby League with the uh, Wigan Saints and Hull Derby with packed crowds, so... It, it did feel slightly different, if I'm honest, this year to have uh, such a, a big game, but behind closed doors. But I suppose that's just the, the changing way of the world at the moment, isn't it? So hopefully we'll soon we'll be able to get back to big crowds again. It'll feel back to some kind of normality. How have you? How have you? How have you found that? Spoke there that you're a super league guy. In, ter- in terms of no crowds, it it's different. It, it, you know, all, all I can say to people. And the same within football, it's just very different. Uh, you hear everything the players say, you, you hear the sidelines, you, you you can hear teams talking about the, the next move they're going to make. Um, and not having that kind of buzz of a, of, of a crowd, whether they be calling forward or offside, whatever it may be, it is is different. I'm, I'm of the probably the kind of the view that I do I do miss that. I miss the almost the noise that it generates and the atmosphere within the ground, certainly in a big game as well. Um, so, so for me, uh, the sooner they can get back, the better. But it, it is just very different. It, it almost the, the only way I can describe it is it feels like a, a pre-season training match behind closed doors when re- really there's no no noise or atmosphere. It is like a practice match. But actually, the big games when there's Wembley or Cup finals at stake. So it, it, it's, it's the same pressure there, but a different environment. Do you feel like it's it's I mean, our ref, our ref games this season behind closed doors, and it does feel like sometimes that it takes you longer to get into the game, and you can find yourself not drifting away in terms of not being concentrated. But you do you do find times where where you just may not be with it for the first 10, 15 minutes. Have you found that yourself while the game's been behind closed doors? Yeah, I think I think there's an element of that. I, I said to him, I, I touch judges in my video ref usually when when we go out is that. First ten minutes is, I think, in most games, the first ten minutes is the hardest bit because t- you jump teams are getting a feel about you, trying to settle into the game and seeing what they can get off off me really. So I, I think the first ten minutes is generally harder, but even more so um, behind closed doors because you are straight into it. You like I said, you've not got the buzz of the crowd, so it, it is about being switched on from minute one. I know that's a cliche about you know you, you, you literally from the first whistle you, you're you're on it, uh, but even more so now. I, I probably go as far as saying as well, even later in the match that works as well. Especially if the team, if the score is kind of going out one way against one team, it, it, it is just almost. I have some triggers of almost just be like, come on, you know, make sure you you're on it now because it's so easy in, in any sport. By the way, if a team's you know winning easy, or it, it can be so easy just for one second just to slip your concentration. So one thing I'm really keen on is you're just having little trigger points of being right. Come on, get back on it now. If you can just feel yourself, just even if it's just one percent, um. So I think I know. I think that's a good point. Actually, you've raised. So I think we'll take take you back to the start. So obviously, why and how did you first get into refereeing? Uh, if I'm honest, by complete accident. You know, I, I've not yet met a professional referee in any sport who've said. That are from the minute I did the course, I, 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 that my aim was to be a professional referee. I've not met anybody who said that yet, but literally for me it was complete fluke. And um, I played rugby when I was uh, when I was younger, so I played uh, in my local club. I played from school, and I, I was 16 at the time, and I thought I was just an average player. Really, I was never never going to make it professionally, but I just don't care. And I thought, you know what, I'll give it a go. And if I'm honest, for a little bit of extra pocket money because the money was okay to referee Sunday mornings. And uh, I just thought I'd give it a get, get myself fit. And I'd not lost nothing, really, if I didn't like it. So no expectations whatsoever. Did the course, like, like I said, when I was 16, just going on 17. And basically, it just kind of went from there. The, the minute I did the course, uh, I just absolutely, I, I loved it. I, I enjoyed being out in the middle. I, my first game was a festival. 
I remember, and and it was just something that I just really enjoyed. The buzz of being in the middle, making decisions, and and being involved with the game really uh, was was a big one for me. And and gradually, it, it just got more spiral from there. I got myself fit because uh, I was dedicated to it. Was training hard, and it'll be a similar pathway in football. But you start off say like under twelves level. Uh, in, in the community game and you work your way up to under 13s and the 14s which at the time feels like a really big step but actually from it, it happened quite quickly really as it come through the pathway and um, but but def- that was the starting point so in answer to your question complete fluke and, and an accident really I had no no family as referees and stuff like that what people and other people have backgrounds and families the, the dad might have done it the granddad but for me literally no no family history of it just a complete accident so I just want to ask you about that, that pathway there, Liam, because you said obviously you progressed through quite quickly through the different age groups. So, so in football, the pathway is quite, it's quite structured and you know, it takes quite a long time to get to the, the elite levels of the game. Um, would you say that the pathway in rugby is quite fluid then to, to allow you to get through if your talent allows you to do so? Yeah, I would actually. I'd say it, the pathway is flexible in terms of... So we have it, and I know the football model is, is a similar type model. So we'd have... Uh, the entry point. So anybody who's a community match will be on the entry point. And then you would move into the emerging group, which the emerging group's kind of like your, your first step really onto uh, the pro game, in, well, professional game in terms of being, you might touch judge the, um, the academy level, the scholarship level, uh, and go into that band. Then you can also referee as an emerging referee as well uh, on a slightly different pathway. And then you move into the select group eventually, which is like the championship. So football-wise, at the select group too, I think it is in football, the championship yeah. in League One. And then eventually you move on to the elite group, um, which is just the full-time Super League ref. So, but within that, it is what, what we're keen on is anybody who shows potential, we can kind of nurture them through the pathway. So it is flexible. And if you show potential and show progress, especially early on, there's this progression through that pathway. It doesn't need to be a fixed set of time, so to speak, you know, because we've had people who've, for example, played the game who've, and then become good referees on the back of the knowledge we've been playing. So the pathway is going to look slightly more different for them who've experienced with a playing background, et cetera, than it would do for others. So it's just flexible. And ultimately, that I don't think you can put a time span on, on, on talent. You know, if you're, if, if, you, if you're good enough, you're old enough, so to speak. So that, that's the way we t- tend to look at our structure. I mean, you've just finished there on saying, if you're good enough, you're old enough. You know, you were the youngest Challenge Cup final referee last, last year. So that just that just proves that, you know, I think it's something that we, in, in football, it is year after year and it's not guaranteed that you get promoted every year. So do you, Going through the pathway, how many years did you actually spend at each level? And is the um, mid, like mid-season promotions? Can you just get fired up to two levels and then and then knock back down again if you're not performing that well? Uh, you, can, you can do, yeah. There's not as much as say mid-season actual promotions. It's more it's a, you get trial games at, at each level. So, like I said, you start off in the community game. So under 12s, you work your way up to. Uh, you know, through the through the community game, really the age groups until you get to open age. So I was I was fortunate, really. I I I'd worked my way through the path really quickly and was given a chance. I was only eighteen when I refereed my first open age game. Um, so basically, that was it, the, the chance to kind of move on into the pathway. And then I got promoted into the national conference league, which is basically all the community clubs, but in a national competition. So. That, that was certainly a big step, but that happened quite quickly. That I, that was probably only refereeing a couple of years before I actually started refereeing open age. And then within the academy group, I was only in the, the emerging group as it is now. I was only in that maybe 12 months um, before I got promoted to the select group, which is the championship in League One. So in, in answer to your question, yeah, you, you get trial games really, but in terms of promotion, that tends to only happen at the end of the season after our annual fitness test. Yeah. You'll get your recommendations from your coaches as to what level you should be at for the following season, but that is that is down to a fitness test scoring as well. You've got to we we do the I don't know if it's the same in football, but we do the yo-yo test. So you've got to get a certain level on the yo-yo test, and then that that impacts on if you can be promoted onto the grade that you you should be. 
So I was reading before, Liam, and I saw that, you know, you when you finished uni, you got your degree. You, you had a bit of a decision to make in terms of career choice. Um, so before we get onto that, I, I want to ask you how you found balancing and refereeing with studying at the same time. And, you know, how was that difficult for you to do at that time or did you find it OK? Uh, I found that easier, to be honest, because when, when I was at uni, obviously, you live, you very much live the student lifestyle, don't you, in, in some ways, and you it almost felt it that, that I was a full-time referee even at uni because you, or, albeit you do your you know your seminars and your your lectures etc your, your week isn't as stringent as what it would be if you was working for example so I didn't find that as hard it it was very much a crossroads really of, of kind of what you do the bit that I found harder was when I did start working and I was doing a couple of days a week at solicitors in, in Manchester was then actually balancing that with your, your refereeing week as well, because it'd be the same in football, but you, you live your life very much on a, on a Monday night or a Tuesday morning when you get your appointment for the weekend and you, you very much tailor your week around your appointments. So then that could be difficult. For example, if I was working on Friday in Manchester, uh, might only finish at four, four o'clock-ish, and then I might be appointed to referee or touch judge a game in Hull. So you've got the challenge of balancing that to get to a game somewhere, knowing that you want to finish work at maybe four o'clock. So that's a challenge, albeit as well. You've got your previews to fit into your week and you speak to your coaches, to your team and officials on the game as well. So it's it's certainly a lot harder. And one thing I do is that we have a lot of part-time officials in our game and both touch judges on my game on the weekend, both have other jobs. One's a, a criminal barrister and, and, and the other one's a postman. So they both have other jobs of outside of rugby, but it, it, the commitment they show to to officiate, even on a part time basis, for me, I never lose the respect for that because it is a massive commitment that they do. So you just said there that you know there are part time and full time officials super, referee in the Super League. How do you end up going from the part time to the full time? Or is that an option? Yeah, so so we have a we have a group of currently a panel of eight full time referees. So I, that came about for me. I was I was twenty one, and just picking up from that point where I was then, I was I was working a couple of days a week at solicitors, um, and I was doing doing my LPC as well at that point. So it, it was a, literally a case of I I just finished uni, uh, and and job full time referee jobs don't come up at every every kind of so often if that makes sense. They don't come up every week. Yeah, they are quite rare really. Uh, the way it panned out, a couple of people had left. I mean, I think one had retired at that point as well. So it, how it came about was literally uh, my, my plan. My plan was to to become a solicitor and then maybe in the future I consider being a full-time referee. But my, my plan in that point was very much about becoming a solicitor in law and getting a job that way full-time. And literally it's just sprung, just came came one day that a job came up in advertisement. So I had to make a decision really of what, what do you kind of do here? Do you you go with what your probably what your dream is really. You know, you probably my, my dream had become certainly the last couple of years before that was I wanted to become a full time referee. But it, when the job came up, it was like I said, it was a crossroads. It was a big decision for me, and it wasn't it wasn't an easy decision. You know, I, I speak to different referees from other sports as well, and it, it, they, they've been in similar situations. Whether that be at the police, whether that be a teacher, people have different careers, and it's it's a massive decision suddenly to to change your plan, almost to speak, especially at a young age as well. So I made that decision on the basis that it was something I'd always wanted to do. You know, I love refereeing and it's not something I can do when I'm 45, 50, you know, later in life. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now, so to speak. So, and I didn't know when the opportunity was going to come back up again. So I made the decision and apply for the job. And thankfully I got the, I got the job and, you know, looking back at it now it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made, but, Certainly at the time, and, and for any any other people in football, in rugby, whatever it may be, you know, it, it is a difficult decision if that ever if you ever put in that position. So you've got to think it long, think about it long and hard, and ultimately come down to. I came back to that it was refereeing was my passion. It was something that I really loved. So and I'd only really achieve my goals that I wanted if I was a full time official. So. So you spoke there about, you know, you've got that position now, age 21. Um, how, how did you find that transition um, from the, from being an amateur, effectively an amateur official to a professional official? Did you find the, the weight of expectation changed quite a lot or did you find you were, you were okay with that? 
yeah, definitely. The, the expectation massively changes because suddenly you go from being uh, a part-time official to, to this is your full-time job. You know, this is very much your, your job now and your week's tailored around that, whether that be, you, you know, you tra- the, the obvious ones, the training levels. You know, we trained in with a group, we trained together as a group three times a week with like a, a really, really, really tough conditioner who, who trained us hard. So the training level certainly went up. I noticed that almost overnight. But in, in and in terms of the previews as well, you know, you, all the detail you're going into previews, your group reviews, you're looking at the game in a much more detail, in a much more detailed way. The probably what I would say is it, it was almost in some ways like starting over again, because at the community game, players on players get used to you and they know you. Then you move up into the Championship and League One, the same again. That players get used to you, you build your reputation and, and they know you, and you kind of build your reputation as a championship ref and then suddenly you're into Super League then, you're 21, you know, pretty fresh face really. You're almost start, starting again of, you've got to get the respect of the players, you've got to get the respect of the game. There's more high profile games that you'll be on because you're a full-time ref in Super League. So all, all them things, it, it did feel like starting over, but and, but that takes time as well. That, that's something that certainly at Super League level, you can't do overnight. You can't gain respect to players overnight. You can't suddenly become a grand final referee or overnight, if that makes sense. So that that does just take time. So you've just said there that you know you become become the Super League referee at twenty one. Do you feel like people have used your age against you at times, and do you feel like that's been unfair? Yeah, I don't know if used against me is is, is the right one, but. It, 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 you can look at it two ways, I think. I think you can almost say that I, I've learned a little bit now, certainly over the last couple of years, that looking at that first Super League game, what, 2017, I know a hell of a lot more now than, than I knew then. You know, and, and at the time you think, yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready. And, and, and I probably was ready for that. You know, I probably was ready at that point, but it, you just, you can't really put a price on experience, if that makes sense. And yeah, it, yeah in answer to your question, Probably a little bit, a bit, a bit. That was maybe like, oh, he's you know, he's a twenty-one year old lad. He's not. This isn't a super league, you know. Not up to super league and stuff. So maybe the, maybe there is a little bit of that. But you know, I come back to where I started. Really, that for me, if you, there's no age on being ready. It, it's just about you as a person. Each individual is is very different. So for me, at that point, even at twenty-one, I thought I was ready for, for ready for that game and ready for that next step. Um. So so yeah, I think you know. It's, in answer to it, yeah, I think I was ready, but I, I wouldn't say it was used against me. It was just, you know, probably a few questions and a few eyebrows raised, if that makes sense. I mean, I couldn't imagine a 21 year old lad refereeing on the Premier League. I think if that happened, I think I'd raise my eyebrow myself and think, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Well, even in the Premier League, though, because I'm a football fan as well, so you know, I, I watch football and, and you do, I think you just naturally do it within with being an official in any sport. You, yeah you almost take an interest in the officials, you know, and I, I do that in, definitely in the Premier League. And, you know, certainly like looking at Michael Oliver, for example, he, he was really, he, he was a lot young, he was one of the young ones when he came through the system. And then I think probably is it Chris Kavanagh recently, yeah. in, in recent years, he's come on the scene and he was relatively young as well compared to some of the older guys. So, you know, it, it does happen at, at different different age groups maybe, but certainly young ones who have come through within, within other sports and, and don't look at the careers they've had so far. Yeah. So you, obviously we spoke a lot uh, so far about, you know, the successes in your career today and how you've come through the system at, you know, a rapid pace. Um, I wonder if we could just, if you could touch on maybe your, your biggest setback in your career and how, what, did, well, the main thing is what did you do to overcome that as well? Yeah, there's plenty of setbacks, as, as, as you know, as, as, as anyone will tell you. Um, refereeing is, an I hate the cliche, but it, it very much is. It's a, it is a roller coaster because you'll have plenty of, you know, plenty of eyes in officiating, but there's plenty of lows as well and plenty of disappointments. If you, you know, we, we all do it. You, you think, oh, I should have got that game. I should have got that final or whatever it may be. Everyone does that. I think even if you don't say it, because you shouldn't say it, but in your head, you might think it. So one of the biggest qualities I, I think you can have with being, being a referee is you've got to be resilient. And that might be after a bad game, you make a mistake on a high-profile game, and you get you get a criticism on the back of it. You've got to be resilient to, to get over that and, and get better from it. That's something. There's a couple of examples that I can think of coming through. 
you know, you touched on already, but it, it was a rapid rise. But there were, there were a few speed bumps along the way as well. There of of kind of on on either poor games or not great games that really probably set me back a little bit as well. So it wasn't just a complete kind of rise, so to speak. There was there was a few dips in there as well where you just got to get over. There's one game I can think of where for whatever reason on the game it just didn't just didn't go right and just almost I couldn't. You, you guys have probably fought in football as well where you just think, I can't buy a call here. I can't buy a call to get one right. And just on the game, it was on Sky as well. So that, that that you know, that doesn't help with it being televised and stuff that the game had just gone wrong. The team had lost a bit on the back of a couple of decisions, really. And, you know, there's no worse, no worse feeling coming away from a ground thinking that you, you've you cost a team the game, so to speak. You know, it's bad enough thinking, right, I made a mistake. But if a team's lost directly on, decisions then that's a it's a tough one to take really um but ultimately you, you, you're going to have them I think you, you're going to have you're going to make mistakes and I think in the long run I always said to young officials now that you're going, you're going to make mistakes and actually sometimes them them bad games can be really good for you in the long run because you know you've got to get used to almost that feeling of you know come on you know learn from this mistake so to speak so we shouldn't we shouldn't be scared about going out on a game making making mistakes because we will do players in football players in rugby league will all make mistakes in a game referees will do that's just not natural uh, it, it is just about and I know it's I come about sounding like some of the coaches I had when I was younger now but as long as you learn from them mistakes and as long as you can you can build on that and, and you don't let it dissart you so much and you can be resilient and come back out the next week and referee and learn from it then don't take it to heart, so to speak. So that's where I got to. And I, I always used to think coming through when I used to watch the referees in rugby league that when I was coming through the system was I always thought the best referees are the ones that can can have a mistake or have a bad game, but then move on the quickest. You know, some, some referees can turn maybe one bad game or one bad decision into three or four weeks of bad, a dip in form. You know, and that's a real challenge in itself as well. That It's much easier said than done or come out next week and, you know, get back out there and, and get on with it. But it, it, that is difficult. That can be difficult when you, when your confidence has dropped. But the, for me, the best ones are the ones that can can, can get over that and can, and can kick on from it. We, we've spoke there that, you know, you're the football fan yourself. And I think as a football referee, our biggest challenge is on managing players. I think obviously the, cult, the culture in football and rugby is completely different. And we'll come on to that a bit later. What do you think your biggest challenge is as being a rugby league match official? Um, management, management's key. Management is absolutely key. The game is the game is so quick now within rugby league. The challenge is you've so many decisions to make. You, you know you can you can look at stats and stuff like that. We've got so six tackles and there's decisions within every single play of the ball. So it, the speed of the game is so quick. Um, and and just naturally, you're never going to get everything right. It, it's and, and the key thing is, is getting the key decisions right. I think managing the game is important for us, and, and as a key facet to the game in terms of managing players, managing the flow of the game, because it, it can be within rugby league. It, a lot of the game is about flow. It, you've got to get a flow to it, otherwise, for whatever reason, it can it become it can become stop uh, stop start. So. For us, it's about getting the key decisions right, but also managing managing the feel of the game um, and, and keeping it flowing to keep it the spectacle. I know you mentioned you watched the Leeds and Cass game the other day. Is that 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 one is a game that just flowed, which is what, exactly what we want. We want to take a back seat uh, and referee the game and let the players almost kind of get you know throw the ball about and score them miraculous tries. That there's no better feeling than we when we come off the game and thinking. You've been in the middle of a great game there that's flawed, end-to-end, -end, really close. Both teams have, have, have had a fair go and, and the best team on the day has won. You know, there's no better feeling than that, but there's plenty of challenges, but probably decision-making, ultimately, that's what that's what it comes down to. Yeah. So th this question comes in two parts, really. Um, so as a professional match official, uh, I, I wondered if you could talk us and the listeners through what, what what the week before a game looks like for you in terms of travel tactics preparation um, but but also um, if you could maybe mention how that might have changed during the pandemic as well compared to what you might have been doing before 
Yeah, well, it's, to be honest, it's, it's completely changed, really. In, in terms of pre, pre-lockdown, pre a normal a normal week would look like. Um, so we, we'd get our appointments on Monday night, usually. We'd get an email telling us which uh, which games are on for the weekend. So your preparation really starts from there, if I'm honest. Tuesday, we would train um, as, a, as a group. So that Tuesday, Tuesday morning would normally be a high-intensity training session, really. So it'd be an hour and a half uh, on the track, maybe, or doing a field session, and then into maybe a gym session, gym circuit with some weights. Um, we, we'd get back, we'd do a, a group review session together as a full-time ref so over in Leeds. So we'd all sit in the group review while the coaches would talk through maybe themes from the weekend. That could involve rooks, foul play, management of players, Whatever it may, whatever generally the theme from the weekend was, we'd look at clips from each of the games just to kind of um, compare, compare and contrast really, and some strategies going forward for us. In terms of after that, we would then very start our preview process. So how, how we look at it would my my personal preview process would be watching both teams from the week before, look at the games, look at the way they play, do they throw the ball about, do they play quite direct in their approach. You know how do they how do they ref, how do they play rugby? So because all teams are different styles, so it's important that we know is there any themes that cropped up with a team the weekend before. So for example, was there any foul play traits? Were there any any incidents that we needed to look at in terms of management management of certain players who might be a bit irate? Um, so all that we would look through the game. Then we put our, our preview together, and that much involved your team, so involved the touch judges, your, your video referee. And your match day coach, who would be appointed to review you that weekend and be your coach. So we'd go through it all, look at clips of, of the teams in terms of how they prepare. But I, I try and make it as, as much about, about about the teams, but about us as a team as well, because we don't have it in um, in rugby because we're, there's people who are dual rolled. You don't work with the same people every week, you know. So that that, that does change. I know I know in football they have the similar, especially in the Premier League, they tend, tend to have the similar uh, assistant referees who they work with within the team, where that in rugby, because there's so many people dual rolled, that, that just doesn't work uh, practically. So it, it is about trying to get as much much out as your team as it is out of us and get the best out of each other. So I, I will do, a, as certainly recently now moving on, I do a Zoom meeting with my touch judges and video ref, just to talk through the, the, the main points of the preview really and what what we want to look for from the game. Then on match day, you'll you'll turn up uh, in a pre-COVID, you, you'd be able to travel together if you lived locally or lived within a relative distance. You travel to the game. So for example, say it's Leeds against Saints, Friday night at Headingley. You travel to the game, go there together, roughly arrive an hour and a half before the game. Um, and then really once you, your preparation is game day preparation. So you're on the game together, you do your warm-up and, and you do the game and then you move on to your review process. So I, I'll generally review a game after, the, the day after. I'd look at the game, look at the clips and, and put my review together, send it out to the team. And then back on Monday morning, you do your one-on-one review with your with your coach, with your match day coach in terms of how, how they rate you off your performance, things to learn from, th- things to, you know, things to put right, really. Um, but it going on to the second part of your question, that changed quite significantly because of lockdown, because obviously as a full-time group, we've been training remotely for the last 12 months. So we've not been training as, as a group together for now for since March last year. So that's that's presented different challenges in terms of you don't have the same camaraderie, I suppose to speak, but we've been doing Zoom meetings after this one I'm speaking to you guys. We've got our group review from the weekend just gone. So it it's it just it's just very different. I think in some ways it's good. There's pros and cons to it, by the way, that you know, from my point of view, I don't have to travel, sit in the car and travel to Leeds up the M62 three times a week. So there's definitely pros and cons, but I, I think when when we do get back to some normality, it'll it'll be better for us as a group, I think. Long-winded answer there, sorry about but it would be in two parts of what I better explain it. I can't accuse you of a lack of depth from that one, that's right. <laughs> Lost me there. No, you're, st- you're still there, mate. Got you. It just froze for me there. <laughs> that's that's scouts internet. Obviously, I haven't paid the bill. <laughs> I actually lived in Liverpool yeah. at uni as well, so um, yeah. 
in, in Wavertree. So that that, that tells oh, you yeah. where, where yeah. I was about there, yeah. So yeah. Where are we off to there? We just finished the answer about uh, sort of training during COVID and pre-COVID. Right. So I'll, I'll pick it back up now. Um, I'll pick it back up with... Right, okay. So obviously, how do you gain the respect of the players? Um, obviously, rugby's, rugby's culture. Now, I, play, I, played, um, I played rugby league in school and I played in college. Now... We had to use the call the referee said. Did they still call you said in Super League or did they call you are they able to call you Liam? Uh generally the call, sir. Yeah, yeah. So that, that that that's always kept in it. I, I, I'm not, if I'm honest, I've never been one of them for the formality, so to speak. So it, yeah. if they call me Liam, because you do you referee the similar similar teams and similar players, and you do get to know know the players quite personally. So I have no issue if they call me Liam, to be honest, on the game. But generally speaking, across the board, they'll call you sir. So I think, like what you're saying, I think it's just ingrained in players. Ingrained, yeah. I always found, I didn't find it weird, but obviously because I played, because I played football and I played rugby, I, I, I mean, when I played, I was a nightmare in terms in terms of the sense. And I, I always say this, you know, I, I am poached to turn gamekeeper because um, I was an absolute nightmare when I played. But I found, I, I must admit, when I played rugby, I did find it hard um, to to call them sir and, and not sort of answer back. But what do you think football can learn from from rugby in terms of in shifting that culture? I think football's got a long way to go. Um, but what do you think we can learn from rugby? Yeah, I think it's a it's like I said, it was it's in, it's ingrained in rugby league players just to, for that respect of calling the referee sir, and that's. That's not something that's happened over a few weeks. That is literally talking years, probably over a hundred years back now of history of that is just the norm of the respect to referees and call them sir. That's not to say, by the way, a player doesn't never steps out of line within rugby league and that we don't have to deal with them, you know, like quite for, well, not forcefully, but we have to deal with them with uh, some kind of deterrent. But one thing within football is that it can't. It's not going to be something that changes overnight. I think it's got to be a gradual shift. And it can't just be, you know, Callum Jones going out on the field one week and suddenly booking somebody for descent or booking four or five players for descent. It has to be a game-wide approach and probably even from FIFA or UEFA, it's got to be, like you say, it's got to be a culture, a, a big culture shift if, if that is, is to be changed. Um, you know, I, you guys are, are, are just, football is different, isn't it? So it's, it's difficult to compare to other sports, but, you know, it, 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 it's just different the way the the games refereed the game, the way the way the games played. Um, you know, the amount of money that's in football now, you know, it's it's un- unbelievable, really. So, I think in, in answering it is that it can't happen overnight. You, you're not, you can't suddenly say, well, we're going to be like rugby union, rugby league. You know, what, that just doesn't happen overnight. It's probably going to be a gradual shift that comes from a lot higher up than what we're talking um, from certainly from the top of the game I think down really that needs to change So we mentioned before about you know moving up the level and dealing with new players new experiences how, how do you gain the respective players as you, as you move through and maybe obviously when you came onto the Super League do you think it helps obviously because of rugby's culture or do you still find that difficult are there any methods you use? Uh, I think it helps I think the, the, the biggest one is is just time um, you know they'll have the respect for you the more you referee them and the more they see you you know they see you on the games and they almost get used to you um, you know for, for me that this year at the back end of this year I had a refereed 100 games in Super League at the back end of this year which you know which, which is a lot really compared to and it feels like, doesn't feel like two minutes since when I first started but over that time I've refereed the team multiple multiple times in, in, in more recently in big games and I think they get respect for you when you deal with them right and, and manage them manage them well. Um, so my style has always been about being approachable. You know, I, I, I want to be approachable to players and feel that players can speak to me as well, provided it's in the right way. Um, be approachable to players. That, that's work for me. I think certainly when you're first starting, I think that there's an element of you're the new kid on the block kind of thing and no one really knows and they're trying to work you out. Where I think gradually over time, when you do referee teams and players so many times, it they just 
they just almost get used to you and, and they've got, hopefully, a lot to think they've got that respect for you now. So, I think if we didn't talk about technology within rugby, I think we'd, we'd be doing ourselves a disservice. Um, I think Super, Super League and rugby in general is very... Um, they've adopted technology well, I, I think. You know, 25 years ago in, in Australia, they, they started with the video ref. You know, in 2013, they brought ref cam in and all your conversations are broadcast over the television. Why do you think rugby is so more embracing of technology, whereas we've seen the difficulty that football about when when embracing VAR? Uh, I think it's, I think like you say, it goes. I think what people don't realise is like what you just said. It, it's twenty five years since we we brought the video referee in, so that's a hell of a long time ago now. And you know, and it's probably important to say with football is that that they, they brought it. Football have brought this in. You know, kind of for the start of last season was it and it was always going to have challenges you know when we brought it in 25 years ago it, it wasn't perfect and, and we had challenges and and we got things wrong and I think probably what people expected with, with VAR was an expectation that it would come in and every decision would be right now you, you know one thing you will never do is eliminate human error in, in any with any technology you know we saw with the Sheffield United game last year was a Sheffield United Villa when the goal line technology uh, stopped working. So you, you, you will never, in, in, under anything, nothing is ever 100%. And I think football have probably realised that like we did such a long time ago. Um, in terms of being, I think football at that point where they probably thought, well, we need, this is, it's, it's now or never, so to speak. Um, I think they still got some hurdles to get over football in terms of, in, just like we did. But I, I actually think in, in some ways, there's a bit of short-term pain involved. You know, people are getting used to VAR and tweaking the system. But I think maybe they've got all that little short-term pain now of, you know, and people are starting to get used to it. And um, what no one really ever thinks about is, is the actual referees themselves. You know, pre-last year, they have no experience that people might have had a 20-year career refereeing Premier League or whatever and never used VAR before. So suddenly you're telling referees to, oh, this is this a new, complete new new system within refereeing that's evolved here. And that takes time for them to adapt as well, just like it does with us with video refereeing. So I, I think I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of VAR in football and I, and I think it, it is the future. And I think it eliminates more errors than, than what it creates, in my view. Um, like with, with the offside and stuff like that, you, you can't really win with some people because people will say they want it black and white. Of He's offside, he's not offside. And then others will say, oh, well, no, we don't want it like that. So for, for me, you can't pick and choose. Video technology is factual. We always say that within within Super Leagues, that the minute it goes to a video referee, that you're basing your decision on facts of what you're watching. There's almost no kind of live decision of you on field as a referee. You've got to go purely on what you see factually. Um, and with football, I think there is some short, there's some short-term pain, but I think... I think the referees have actually done really well over the last couple of years with it. And I think you know, over due course, it will only get better as they tweak it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm glad to see it in football, but it, it, it just will take time, just like it did with us 25 years ago. And, we've, and, we've, and we're still not perfect. So. so there's been a lot of talk recently in, within football again um, about the, the broadcasting of the communications of the officials within Stockley Park and VAR around transparency about how they make those decisions. And obviously that is something that already takes place within rugby. So when, when you first started dealing with that in rugby, did you have any fears about your conversations being broadcast or did you have to adapt the way you were speaking at all? Uh, no, not, I won't say worries because I think the difference within rugby was uh, since I've come through, it's always been the case that I've known that the when you're on TV game, and, and even when you're not on a TV game, you com your communications are recorded. So the, the clubs can listen to what we're saying and um, anybody can listen to it really, and certainly on Sky or a BBC game. Every, everyone can listen to every single word you're saying. Um, there's pros and cons to both in my I, I listened to this on a podcast actually the other day about um, should should the referee comms be, be broadcast within football and there's pros and cons to both arguments, in my opinion. The pros are, 
obviously that you, for in terms of fan and spectators and um, commentators, etc., they can listen to the referee and you can understand how he's come to a decision, which I think is good. I think that is good. Um, the, the cons to it on the other flip side of that is, is a referee does need to be a little bit more cautious about what he's saying because he knows that it's being broadcast to, to the game worldwide. So it does maybe take away slightly on management of players, of maybe because you, you're a little bit more restricted on what you can actually say to players. And certainly I'm conscious of that a little bit more of when you're on a Sky or BBC game, you are very conscious that you've got a mic there that's live to the nation, so to speak. So you've got to be very careful at what you say. But that can help you in a lot of ways as well, because certainly for us within rugby, if they can understand that we've already spoken to a player, warned him about you know an incident or whatever, or set you know repeatedly tried to work with a player, set it you know set the game up, and we've put a lot of work in, and not just come to a rash decision, that helps us a lot more, I think, because you know the general feel of the commentators might say, well, you can hear the referee; he's, he's spoken to him three or four times now about this, and he's had no other option now but to come to that decision. So that that can help. In football, it's different. It would just be a big sea change. What we do, what we do in rugby league, for example. So the, the Challenge Cup this weekend, I'm the video referee on the the Leeds Saints game. Um, what we do is that the video referee, once it comes to the screen, uh, the video referee will talk with the broadcast and he speaks through his decisions. So maybe that's something within football that the VAR could do. Um, that might be a better better way of doing it rather than the on field referee, in my opinion. Um, but from, from what I could gather from that podcast, I think football's still a few years away from that yet anyway. I think, um, I think no, we've, we've, we've talked all the way through three career, we've talked on technology and everything else. You know, you were the cha- Challenge Cup final referee last year, um, which for those who don't know, it's the equivalent of the FA Cup, isn't it? Uh, for, for Rugby yeah. League. So it starts with all the lower level teams all the way right through to Super League. How did you feel when you got that appointment and what was it like on the day of the, day of the games down at Wembley? Oh, um, um, like you say, the, the best way I could put it is, is the FA Cup final for football referees is that you grow up kind of watching rugby league, you want to referee the Challenge Cup final. That's the that's the almost the pinnacle domestically, really, for, for us as, as a referee. So to kind of get that appointment, so especially at a young age as well, you know, it, it was just unbelievable. Um you know, there's a lot of things and you can relate to this in football I know but for, for it's the stuff that happens probably it took me back to my mum and dad taking me to a game like a community game under 13s or the, the amount of work that goes on before that when you come as I talked about coming through the community game and stuff is that you almost feel like that's your you know it was all worth it so to speak to get that you know to get that appointment so um, unbelievably uh, pleased for my family as well more than anything else for them to kind of see it materialise after all them years of, of doing community games. So, yeah, the, the highest honour you can ever have have been within rugby league domestically, in my opinion, is to referee the Challenge Cup final. So to do that, unbelievable honour. Um, and in terms of Wembley itself, it was a different feel. Wembley's special. Wembley's unbelievably special. It's still the, for me, it's still the place that you, you always want to referee. Um, different, no crowd for a Challenge Cup final, which would have been the same for the FA Cup final last year, which was... So a little bit somber in that, and but it, it, I was just the probably the, the only uh, the sad note on it was that my family couldn't couldn't be there at, at Wembley to watch it. But you know that that's that's the motivation now to kind of get back there again, either this year or in years to come. You know, can to, to do the final again uh, with a full crowd there and your family there. So yeah, massive achievement and something that you, you described it well in your your, your question. Did, it's like the FA Cup final for us, so it's, it's the pinnacle. So I think I think before we finish, Liam, I think it would be remiss of us to ignore your role as a recruitment and development manager for the RFL. Um, and, you know, for anyone who's thinking about maybe getting into refereeing, specifically rugby refereeing, what, what would you say to them and how would they go about doing it? Oh, give it give it a try, basically. That's the, you know, anybody who, if any referee really, is, it's a similar skill set, you know, speaking to you guys that, the skill sets that we have in officiating, whether that be football or rugby, are very similar. 
you know, albeit the rules are different and, you know, there's, there's, there's differences between the, but the skill set in terms of what you need as core skills are very, are very much the same. So anybody think about giving it a go, then we've got the website of uh, become a match official website that, that have all, has all the courses on at the moment, they are online courses because we're running them via, via zoom, but um, or get in touch with me directly. I can pass my details on them, but anybody wants or get, just wanted to give it a try, really just, pick up the whistle, give, give it a go. Um, there's no no pressure. Just like, like I was, no expectations. You, you never know, you might just love it. Brilliant, brilliant, Liam. Well, thanks for your time uh, this morning. Really appreciate it. There's been some really, really great insights there for the listeners and for me and Callum as well. Um, all the best yeah. for the rest of the season as well. Um, and we'll be, we'll be following the rest of your refereeing journey closely. No problem. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. I'll see you at a Warrington Bowl game some point this this season when the fans are back. Oh, is that your look? Is that the one you go to Warrington? Yeah, I go watch Warrington, so I'll give it a shout if I see you. Oh, yeah. No, you should. No, that's a, uh, as long as it's not an offside or a forward. Oh, I'll just see you. <laughs> pick me right in the stand. But, uh, no, it'll be good. It'll be a good one to get back. That's the... Yeah. Definitely. No, yeah, but good luck to you. Thanks for your time. All the best. Yeah.